having us. Super excited to be here and have this uh, conversation with you. Um, so I am a rising second year PhD student um, in computational neuroscience at Boston University in the United States. Um, I primarily uh, study anesthesia, um, but from like a computational perspective. So I sort of split my time between our medical school and um, our department of mathematics. Um, so I guess I'll pass it off to Vivian. Thank you, Patrick. Hi, everybody. My name is Vivian. I'm a rising second year MPH student at the University of Pittsburgh, where I'm studying human genetics. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm, MPH programs are generally two years, so I'm about halfway through. Um, and yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. I think public health is a really cool field and a nice kind of like, it's kind of cool, like seeing how like genetics could play a role in public health as well. Um, so yeah. And then I guess I'll pass to Spatika. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Spatika. I'm a graduate student in neuroscience at Oxford, and I will be studying my PhD at Cambridge in a month or two, maybe. Um, yeah, I work in behavioral and systems neuroscience, and um, I think that's about it. Yeah, I will pass on to our final panelist. Hello, everyone. My name is Stilmo. Uh... I'm a senior master's in public health candidate at the University of North Carolina Gilling School of Global Public Health. Uh, my studies focus in applied epidemiology and specifically my interests lie in environmental exposures and neurological health outcomes, specifically being pesticides exposures and uh, air pollution exposures related to cognitive impairment, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much, Patrick, Vivian, Spatika, and Somil. So um, just to kick off, we can start with a general question of what made you choose graduate studies and what made you choose the field that you are in at the moment? Um, who wants to begin? I can start. So um, personally, I studied public health as an undergraduate student and, and my, my undergraduate experience was highly shadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic. I really got the experience of seeing how public health has such a huge role in society and healthcare. And um, as someone who is planning to apply to medical school next year, uh, this motivated me during my time to, to take the time to apply to graduate school. Um, specifically because I hope to be a practitioner in the future that's involved in research. And I found epidemiology really interesting because it sort of uh, designs how a lot of studies are conducted and how um, determinants of health are identified and how associations can really be made that influence how, how health interventions and health knowledge is increased. So I thought it would be valuable to, to pursue graduate studies in, in that field before I applied to medical school, just so I have that research experience and that knowledge of how studies flow and are conducted, so I could still be involved in that um, in the future. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so I can go uh, next. Um, I think my my interest in the sort of the brain, psychology, neuroscience, etc. Um, started actually in philosophy. Um, so when I was an undergraduate, uh, one of the first classes I took uh, was something called personal identity. Um, and we sort of pulled on a, a whole bunch of different disciplines uh, in that class. Um, but really, we were trying to explore uh, over time how people have thought about their own identities, uh, how they relate to themselves at the different stages of their lives and things along those lines. Um, pretty quickly, that triggered my interest in um, sort of like what makes um, those sorts of experiences um, pick. So I was really interested in um, the underlying bio uh, biology of more complex um, human behaviors. So I got really into uh, something called episodic memory. So like the memory of our actual experiences in a particular space and time. Um, so uh, I studied that throughout my undergraduate career, did a bunch of research in that. Um, but I realized that I wanted to sort of pursue research as a career. 
Um, so towards the end of my un undergraduate experience, I spent a lot of time sort of prepping for um, graduate school applications and things along those lines. And I ultimately went into my PhD right out of undergraduate. Um, and I think it, for, for me, it was an easier decision to make um, because one, the interest was there, but two, it's a fully, my program's fully funded. Um, so I get a salary every year. And so uh, I came from um, like lower middle class background and um, I didn't want to take on any student loans because that wasn't really an option. And so it was kind of nice that those aligned for my um, personal experiences. Um, and so now uh, I'm sort of reinforced in the idea that I want to continue doing research. Um, I now sort of have a, a, a medical tinge to my um, research program, um, but it's really exciting to be able to ask like big questions and collaborate with folks from a lot of different disciplines. And I feel like, especially in quote unquote, like consciousness research, or at least lowercase c consciousness research, um, uh, I'm able to sort of uh, uh, scratch my interest in um, philosophy uh, while still pursuing uh, science and trying to help people. So yeah, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. Anyone else? I don't I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Uh, should I go ahead? Okay. Um, yeah, I did my undergraduate degree in India and I moved here last year. And um, I think uh, I knew I wanted to go to grad school because neuroscience has become such an evolved field that um, it's just so big. It requires further research for you to have a robust grasp on it. And the current masters that I'm doing at Oxford came with um, funding. So I was able to come over here and um, they really emphasized the broadness of the field by making us choose our own rotations and experiments and things like that. So I guess if you really want to go deep into a subject and especially if it's a subject that's really exploded in the last decade, like neuroscience has, uh, you probably want to consider grad school. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, I was actually a neuroscience major as an undergrad, but during my senior year of undergrad, I took my first ever genetics class, and I thought it was really, really cool. It was my first kind of class like that, and it's where I also found out about precision medicine and precision public health and how genetics can play a really big role in these fields. And so that's kind of when I decided, like, okay, I think I want to do some kind of graduate program in genetics and so I was kind of looking to see like what's out there in genetics um, and so I had looked at a lot of like MS programs um, at first but then I found at University of Pittsburgh they have an MPH in genetics and I think it's one of two MPH in genetics programs in the country and I like the MPH a lot just because it does it does like focus a lot on public health and versus like an MS is, def is generally a lot more research oriented and with an MPH, I feel like I can do a lot more than just research. I have a lot of other different options. And so I really like that aspect of the program. Also, um, my MPH program, um, they work really hard to help you find an internship um, in between your first and second year. So that way you can get some experience kind of in the field that you're interested in. And so that's one that I really wanted to have as well, like considering, you know, once you graduate, like at that point, you're just working. <laughs> So I definitely wanted to make sure I was going to have that opportunity to get some experience there. So that's why I chose my program. Thank you so much. So um, of course, before you joined graduate school, there was the whole application process. So what can you tell us about that, especially um, the rigor or maybe the competitiveness and how exactly you made it through to, you can even make reference to the universities you're in, that's perfectly okay. Yeah, um, Vivian, you can continue. Sure, so I would, I would generally say it's actually not that much different than applying for undergrad, except that some programs have interviews, which I think for undergrad, you don't really have interviews, but yeah, generally you have like, you're like, they might have some application questions, kind of some general, personal information about yourself. Then there's like a personal statement, a resume, CV. Um, and then sometimes they'll have an interview as well. Um, I would say, hmm, as far as like application advice, I would just say like making sure 
that you're really showing that you are able to accomplish grad school I think that's like the biggest thing is just like you know you don't have to have like the perfect grades and stuff but making sure that you know because they want to make sure that they get students that can actually like do grad school and like do well in grad school um, just making sure that you are, look like a well-rounded candidate um, so this could also come from like you know let, rec letters from professors saying like you know this person is like you know very good like they do all these things in class and so they're very involved very engaged um it could be also like other projects you do outside of school but um yeah I just like would make sure to like present yourself in a way that's like I will be a successful candidate for grad school and this is why and then I'll, so I'll pass to whoever yeah I'll shake you can go next totally um, so one thing I, I definitely want to emphasize, and this is sort of um, piggybacking off of um, Vivian, but um, you really want to tailor your application to the type of graduate school um, that you're applying to. And so we have a, a pretty um, diverse selection of graduate school experiences here. Obviously, some aren't represented, um, but some programs, like you already heard, um, like Master, Masters of Public Health, um, we'll have like a little bit of a research component and, um, you know, pulls in a lot of different experiences that like sort of carry outside of the research realm, whereas a PhD is uh, highly emphasized on the research component. And so um, the reason that matters is to my application was less about sort of me as an individual um, and sort of like what um, I'm more or less hoping to get out of graduate school and more about the actual uh, research experience that I, I had and um, my ideas for research at a program and why I'm picking the program um, I'm applying to. Um, are there enough people there to help support me to succeed in the program and things along those lines. Um, and so I, I was lucky and unlucky to sort of not know if I was going to get into my PhD when I applied. Um, so I applied to master's, PhDs, and to what are called like research assistantship or like research uh, technician positions, which are typically like one or two year positions before often you go and pursue a master's PhD or in some cases like a medical school uh, degree. Um, and so the processes that I went through all of those um, or in each of those categories was, was pretty different. Um, so some of them, for example, the research tech and the PhD were highly similar. So I was just sort of saying, these are the skills that I have. This is my plan when I arrive. This is what I'm hoping to develop. Um, whereas with masters, uh, they were really interested in um, not only my background in research, but a lot of sort of the interpersonal um, skills that I have. Um, what sort of sort of like steward of the program would I be when I arrive? What was I involved with in undergrad and things along those lines? So one bit of advice I would give um, is identify people in the programs you want to apply to, uh, particularly students or uh, postdocs um, in, in some cases, and, and sort of ask them about their experiences in the program uh, to get a better idea of um, what they're looking for in the application process, what life is like when you arrive, and things along those lines, just because it's pretty specific. Um, so I'll pass it off to other folks. but. Patika, feel free to go next. Um, I think Vivian and Patrick have said it very well. Um, should we move on to another question if uh, Somal doesn't have anything to add? Yeah, I was just going to add that. So when I applied to grad school, I applied in the beginning of my senior year of undergraduate study. Um, I think it's always good to be proactive if you know this is something you definitely want to do with your career. Um, some things that I kept in mind when I was looking at different programs, um, I would say look at the faculty of the program that you are interested in, look at their research interests, um, look at what the school does. And, and a huge thing that stuck out to me is always look at your school's mission, because a lot of times the mission of the school will sort of design or articulate the way your courses will be designed. And so at least for me, um, one thing that stuck out to me about uh, University of North Carolina is they have a clear mission to fighting systemic racism and systemic biases that are across the healthcare system. And 
as someone who's had experience before graduate school working with underserved populations, um, those under the federal poverty line, um, the populations that have had historical traumas, this stood out to me as um, I definitely want to continue with my career working with these populations and improving their health outcomes. And um, so that's why the mission really stood out to me when I was applying, and it was a little bit easier to write my personal statement around that. Um, and then another thing I would also just add is um, sometimes schools have rolling admission. So you'll really find out if you get in sooner than other schools, which can highly affect uh, the outcome which, with what you go with. So um, I would say just consider always the timeline of the school, if, if they get back to you earlier, if they give scholarships, uh, look at the faculty and um, really read the school's mission, because that will really be the way the, the courses are designed, the way the professors interact with you and, and how you're gauged in assignment. Thank you so much. And I'm finally starting to see some participation in the chat. So I think we're going to move on to the questions from the participants. And so some questions that I've seen that are somehow similar. As someone interested in neuroscience as a high school senior, do you recommend majoring in neuroscience on a pre-med track for undergrad? Another question was, um, as someone, someone else is also in high school asking about uh, how to choose the best university for neuroscience. Um, so, oh. oh, go ahead if you wanna start off. Okay, um, no, I was just gonna say that neuroscience is a, is a very varied field. So as a graduate student, I've seen undergrads come in from all sorts of backgrounds and they're, they're really able to thrive here because we need all sorts of people to work in neuroscience. We need physicists, we need mathematicians, um, we need biologists, and, and we need chemists. So um, I, in fact, see a lot of people who come from humanities backgrounds and also work within the linguistics and other sides of neuroscience. So honestly, I would personally recommend doing doing what interests you right now and not what you're not interested in, but which might possibly be something that might lead you to neuroscience later, because you can definitely approach internships and things like that from any sort of angle. So um, I did not do my undergrad in the, in the US, but I would recommend doing a major or anything like that, which is uh, currently your interest. And then um, I, I can guarantee that it will change as you go over the years because mine definitely did. I did my undergrad in biology and I had a chance to see both the cellular molecular sides and the clinical sides of neuroscience. And they're very different and they require very different skill sets. But um, there are definitely things you can pick up by means of internships and courses and things like that. So just do what interests you right now. Um, and I'm sure you'll find your way into uh, neuroscience. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I sort of moved around to different subjects. I think I changed my major, <clears throat> I don't know, three or four times in undergraduate, started with philosophy, got into linguistics, ended up studying memory, um, and then pursued neuroscience for the rest of my time there. Um, it, from a practical standpoint, in terms of admissions, um, it can actually be in your benefit to not study uh, biology or like a neuroscience a specific field, both on the medical school application side, but also in PhDs in neuroscience, which sounds crazy, but it's because uh, as was just mentioned, neuroscience is all, all of these different fields coming together. So there are folks who came from physics, there are people who came from philosophy, people who came from computer science, people who came from sociology, um, and there are a ton of faculty members who do all sorts of really interesting stuff. So for example, one of my colleagues at Harvard uh, studies the intersection of spirituality and neuroscience. And so um, you really just want to sort of pursue these areas that you're interested in, um, you know, gain, because uh, first you want to love what you're doing and um, uh, gain experience in those areas, but it also helps generate ideas that uh, can help move the for field forward um, and also um, can help generate new ideas that will make you an attractive appl applicant if you're trying to do research, either in a PhD, master's, um, you know, master's of public health <clears throat> and things along those lines. Um, in terms of pre-med, 
Um, so I was pre-med for um, my undergraduate career, even though I ended up not going to medical school. Um, and I actually think that, um, at least in terms of my research, it would have served me better if I had less, um, not strenuous, but um, fixed courses that I had to take. Um, reason being, there were a lot of things that don't fall under the traditional pre-medical track um, requirements that um, would have been really helpful in terms of improving my um, identity as a, as a researcher. So I think that, um, you know, there's no need, no reason to sort of put yourself in a box uh, right away. Um, especially if you're at a liberal arts school, that would be even better if you're able to change uh, more readily. Um, but uh, just sort of follow your interests and you're going to arrive where you need to be. There aren't any, you know, correct ways to, to get into neuroscience as a career. And I have seen that. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so right now I'm a rising senior. So will it be like in my benefit if I studied bachelor's in neuroscience, uh, then like uh, did master's, then a PhD? Come again. I'm saying if I get a bachelor's in uh, neuroscience, will I be like, not more apply, but like, uh, how can I say it? Uh, like I have uh, better ch uh, a better chance in completing uh, master's and uh, PhD in neuroscience, or like any kind of major would like put you in uh, in a master's like that. Yeah, I think it depends on where you're applying. So a couple of things, um, U.S. versus non-U.S is one big distinction. Um, in the US, it's uh, especially in neuroscience, it's rare to get a master's. Um, and that's because our programs are structured differently in the sense that like my PhD is like five to six years. Um, but some of my uh, colleagues in Europe, for example, uh, will have a master's and it's a requirement to have a master's before going into your doctorate and your PhD ends up being shorter. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's important. Um, in terms of communicating yourself in an application, it, you're not gonna be at a disadvantage if you don't have uh, a neuroscience undergraduate. And uh, as, a, as I sort of mentioned, and some other folks mentioned, it might be in your interest, but you do need to have some sort of track record that's related to neuroscience to convince someone who's reading your application that you are interested in neuroscience. And um, it's not sort of like an arbitrary choice for why you're applying. Um, some ways to do that are through research experiences, volunteering experiences. Um, you know, I knew someone who was really into like blogging, and so they had a neuroscience blog. Um, neuroscience or science communication writ large is something that you definitely can um, get involved with. Additional coursework, even if it's not your major. Um, the more important thing is how do you construct the narrative that makes the case that you're interested in neuroscience and that you'd be uh, good for the program and a good use of the school's sort of resources and investments into you. Um, they also want to make sure that you're, you know, like a good steward of the program and really try to interact with your um, peers in a positive way. And so that might be through things like outreach, but also, um, you know, Diversity initiatives are really important, especially since neuroscience um, is like a traditionally like white male, wealthy, uh, heteronormative, like you can kind of go down the list uh, field. Um, and so I think like um, making sure that, um, you know, we're incorporating that into the heart of our science is something that's really important. So any of those experiences can be really helpful. You don't have to have a neuroscience degree. But if that's your way of communicating you're interested in neuroscience, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Patrick. And there's actually a question directed to you here. And uh, the question is, as a biologist who has an aversion to maths and numbers, what are some skills I can work on to be able to major in computational neuroscience? Any resource recommendations? Yeah, um, so I'll put my my uh, email down in the, the chat. You can 
send me a note and I, I can pass them on to you. So computational neuroscience, uh, it's weird because it doesn't require uh, a math background or necessarily a computer science per, uh, degree or anything along those lines. Um, it's more of like a, how it was described to me once, it's more of like a vibe. Um, so it's the type of questions that you try to ask. Um, and so it might be utilizing algorithms from other folks. Um, so for example, in genetics, uh, they use a whole bunch of um, computational tools. And so that could be considered computational neuroscience in the sense that you're applying tools to answer biological questions. You don't have to design the algorithms to be classified that way. Um, I'm in a little bit of a different place where, so I am like the methods person. So I develop new methods. So I'm making new algorithms. My thesis is focused on presenting like new math. Um, and so that we're the other spectrum of it. Um, but we're all colleagues and we all interact. Um, so it, it's less of like the label and more of the types of questions you're interested in. With that said, um, I never took formal computer science courses. Um, so I taught myself to code through like free online resources. A big part of my outreach now is uh, creating free resources in R and Python, which are two computer languages for folks. So I'll send you those, um, anyone who's interested in those, just shoot me a note, I can send those along to, to people. Um, on the math side, that was more formal training. So I took classes in undergrad, even though that wasn't my major. So um, you can sort of develop those skills um, in relation to your question, but you don't have to have like a certain skill set in order to do that work. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, before I move to the next question, I just want to alert all the participants that it's really best for you to leave your questions in the chat so that we don't interrupt the speakers meanwhile. But we will have an Q&A session towards the end. So at that time, you'll be free to unmute and have feedback from the speakers. And now on to a more general ground, someone asked, how do you balance your study time with all the busy activities taking place around you? So can you tell us about a day in the life of a graduate student? Sure, I can talk a little bit about this. Um, my schedule kind of changed, like, every, like every day is kind of different. Like I don't go to the lab every single day or anything like that. And there's some days I have classes, some that I don't have classes. Um, but generally, um, if I had like morning classes, I would go into the lab in the afternoon. If I had afternoon class, I'd go to the lab in the morning. And then like in the evening when I would go home, that was really like my biggest study time it was like I would, would, when I'm done with like everything. Um, I was lucky, I worked like in my first year, um, my research was mainly at like a cancer hospital. So like we had a very like nine to five. So I wasn't staying super late hours at the lab or anything like that. Like they would kick us out like at five. <laughs> so um, I think that also really helped me with just like having a nice like work-life balance just like having very normal hours um I don't know how it is for like like university labs like if they make you stay super late or come in super early but um that was my ex <clears throat> excuse me that was my experience like with my first year um yeah those are kind of my biggest things was just like classes and research um, I did have some time for extracurriculars as well. So I was actually um, on the dance team in my first year of graduate school. So it's definitely possible, I think, to like balance multiple things that something you're interested in. But yeah, just being mindful, like, of course, this is graduate school, so it's going to be harder than undergrad. So making sure you do have that time to go to classes and study, but then also like making sure you're doing things to also just develop your skills in whatever field you're interested in. and yeah, working on like developing more work experience as well. But yeah, I would say for me, at least um, this past year, it, it was very doable. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else would like to add on to that topic or should I move to the next question? All right. So I've seen a lot of questions on research topics. 
So many people asking about how to come up with good research topics in neuroscience or the best way to get involved in research outside the university, etc. So I'd like to take us on that. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of questions on uh, research. So there are those asking how they can get involved with research outside the university, but those who are asking about how to actually formulate a research question in neuroscience. Yeah, so that's that's a, that's a question. Sure, um, I can start it off. I'm sure everyone else can continue. Um, so I, uh, during my under grad I managed to do a bunch of summer internships and I think I actually made a, a document listing all these neuroscience based summer internship programs uh, for the uh, simply neuroscience thing last year so I'm happy to share that and um, I think your best bet at getting opportunities is often going through structured programs but um, uh, cold emailing is where everybody starts. You just find professors, you research what they do, and you end up writing to them. And if you're lucky, you get a shot. Um, but uh, that's obviously based on a little more risk. And uh, a program, on the other hand, will expect you to collect a lot more information and submit an application and wait for an outcome. Um, I don't know how many of these are funded research opportunities. Some of them are and some of them aren't but if you're interested then the first step is obviously to start by cold emailing and reaching out to people I would actually recommend starting with people within your department and your circles because they're really more likely to accept you if they've seen a familiar face someone you know who's lectured you um, that's a that's a great option and you often end up doing the most interesting things even in labs where you wouldn't really have thought um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I've only worked on research within um, academic settings. Uh, I'm not sure if there are undergraduate centric research opportunities at the industry level. I don't really know, but I'm sure they might exist. Um, but yeah, uh, this, uh, I think like getting research experience is really great, but um, you, you got to really spread yourself everywhere. Yeah, I also want to add, um, like, I have done research in a hospital. I think that's another great way to develop research experience. It's a little bit more like clinical, a little bit more like patient focused, I think you're interested in. So you don't have to feel limited to just like cold emailing professors or applying like to research positions in your school. You can also look to see like what your local hospitals offer, because a, a lot of hospitals do generally have some researchers in the building as well. So that's another great way to also find research experience. Still on the topic of internships, if any of you have done internships outside the country, how did you manage money, time, et cetera? So I haven't done an internship outside of the country, but one of my main internships I got towards the end of undergraduate uh, was I became an intern with the Parkinson's Foundation nonprofit. Um, and sort of my, my role with them was they wanted to utilize my knowledge of public health to really engage with American Indian and Alaskan Native populations um, that have been typically underserved and, and helps with reaching them with Parkinson's disease education, Parkinson's disease care resources, and uh, just building community relationships. And um, I got that internship actually through uh, a guest lecturer at one of my classes who, who came in, gave a lecture, brought up the internship, and then I was able to apply standardly and, and, and receive it. And, and through that internship, I was able to really gain knowledge of how the nonprofit industry works, um, how, how underserved populations engage with these types of institutions, and um, build my knowledge of Parkinson's disease, which is something I'm quite passionate about. And um, through that, I was also able to work with people across um, various disciplines, being um, registered dietitians, movement disorder neurologists, um, social workers, community health workers. And it really gave me um, a good experience to see how diverse the field of neuroscience can be, um, build my network, and, and, and continue working in a field that um, I was passionate about. Um, so I can't speak on outside of the country, but I would also uh, 
urge people to, to consider looking at nonprofit institutions because I know there's so many um, that are, are based on neurological outcomes being Alzheimer's, Huntington's disease, MSA. Um, and these can be a great, great opportunity to really get your feet wet with, with something in the field of neuroscience and, and also build your network. Thank you so much. So uh, while still going through the chat, I've seen lots of questions on conferences, maximizing on campus student opportunities, the questions about cold emailing, professional communication etiquette, and also the international programs and opportunities. And while these are very important questions, during the week there are actually sessions for those specific topics. And so I highly advise that you attend those. And if not, we'll be making a recording. So for now, I'm just going to focus on the questions that are specifically towards the graduate student panel. Yeah, and the next question was, um, how do you know that you have the specific skills that make you a neuroscientist? Is there a specific skill set? Yeah. I think you're human and you like neuroscience. You're good to go. <laughs> uh, I honestly don't know. Uh, I don't think any of us come with very pre programmed uh, <laughs> neuroscience intuition. I think everybody just learns on the way. And honestly, you'll be good at it. Just, just keep going ahead. I, I don't know what more to say. I'm sure my panelists can add. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it's a good question to ask, but I, I think, um, yeah, especially neuroscience uh, and then my, my like subdiscipline in math, I, th I think uh, folks think they're, there's like some uh, special skill set or a way of thinking, or you have to be like very smart or like, you know, um, all these different things which uh, is not true. Um, you know, you don't have to be the best, you know, biologist, the best mathematician, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's more of like an intense curiosity in things, um, you know, being excited about um, not knowing uh, things. Um, you need to be interested in like reading a lot, um, you know, interested in either developing writing skills or, um, you know, really enjoy writing papers if you're on the more research side. Um, I, I think the more important uh, thing is to realize that uh, no matter what you do to prep, um, you're not going to have all the skills required. Uh, and they know that regardless of what you're applying to, because that's why you're going to get training. Um, so, you know, I think like that intense curiosity in neuroscience and related topics, uh, as was just mentioned, is definitely like the core of it. Um, and so when I'm on uh, admissions committees and things along those lines, uh, that's how we're supposed to read it. Like, does someone have like a, a convincing, convincing narrative, um, given the resources that they've had available to them? Um, that they are interested in neuroscience and it's worth their time and the faculty and staff, et cetera's time um, to support your studies. So um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't worry about um, you know getting every possible skill set and getting every possible opportunity. You know, balance is helpful, things take time, and you'll be just fine. So yeah. Some amazing advice. Uh, so let me just read this on verbatim. I think it just needs to be understood like that. So I am an undergraduate student doing my bachelor's in biology, majoring in genetics, and I'm currently in my third year. I've seen in graduate school applications that you have to submit an essay showing what kind of research you'd like to do, what's your approach, and with which faculty lab, research lab would you like to work with, and who would provide financial support for it. There's a lot of questions. Okay, so could you provide some tips for this, especially when one has never met the faculty or done research in that area? Yeah, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I applied to PhDs, but I also applied to masters and um, research technician jobs. And, uh, while I sort of knew what I was interested in, uh, a lot of the things I applied to were adjacent to sort of my previous research experience and things along those lines. 
Um, so there's two things that I would say uh, on not meeting an advisor um, and you're proposing to work with them. I would highly encourage you to reach out to them before. And even if they can't um, meet on Zoom, for example, um, hopefully they'll give you an email response. It's important to sort of understand their priorities and their personality. And um, while sometimes you're thinking about these applica applications solely in terms of like, is this person willing to work with me? Uh, you need to be willing to work with that person in the sense of like, are they supportive? Is it a good work environment? And things along those lines, a lot of your success is tied to how supportive your research environment actually is more so than the science, which um, when I got that advice, I thought that was ridiculous. And it was definitely all about the work and the science because that's what you're doing. Um, but if it's a terrible environment, you're going to end up hating it anyway. And the probability of you completing it successfully and having a good experience continues to get lower if it's a really bad environment. So definitely reach out to them on that side. Um, the other part of the question, though, when you haven't worked uh, in a research area, um, it's really about the narrative that you tell. So for example, some uh, jobs that I applied to, the closest experience I had to what they were doing was philosophy, um, which is very far <laughs> from what they were doing. So um, if you can make a compelling case of uh, connecting them through a story and how you see them connect, that's more important. Um, so instead of like that, personal statement that you're referring to, sometimes it's called a research statement, being uh, a regurgitation of your resume. It's more of a way to explore uh, and show other people how you see things connecting in the world of science uh, and what you can provide um, to that project um, or um, that you're teachable in terms of skills that you want to learn. Because um, again, a lot of people don't have these research experiences before graduate school. Um, that could be because you know you had a particular major in undergrad, um, your undergrad wasn't uh, very well resourced. Um, even if their resources were present, say you had like personal experiences that prohibited you from taking those opportunities. So whether it's like you know work requirements um, and you couldn't get a paid research role or things along those lines, like people understand that. So it's all about the story. And so you don't have to be perfect at telling that story, but really try to reach out as much as you can to mentors and other folks in your community, whether or not they're in um, you know, graduate programs or if they're faculty, uh, teachers, et cetera, to try to get advice um, in terms of crafting that narrative. Um, I think that'll be more successful than just regurgitating your resume. Yeah, I think I've seen lots of reviews about the holistic view of all applications. So whether internships or whatnot, don't worry, just present your case appropriately. And um, another question I'm seeing is on, um, I really want to know what each of our speakers consider a mistake they made during undergrad, something they would particularly avoid if they got a chance to do their undergrad again. I don't know if I would say it's a mistake. Um, I don't, I don't know. I guess like, I don't like to think about like regrets and stuff like as an undergrad. Like I think a lot of things that I did in undergrad are kind of what brought me to where I am today. But I think something that I wish I had understood better was just the value of mentorship. Um, I think it's something that, you know, I took or I didn't realize was so important. Um, and I think like now actually like you know, as a graduate student, like they kind of assign us research mentors, which I think has been like super, super valuable for me um, going into this field that I like, you know, I didn't do my undergrad in genetics, right? So genetics and public health was generally like a very, a very new kind of area of research for me. Um, but I know like in, in undergrad, you have like all your professors and there are also like some some schools have like kind of programs where they pair like underclassmen with upperclassmen to do kind of like mentorship that way. There's also LinkedIn is a great resource. I've actually um, done like kind of like coffee, like virtual coffee chats or like kind of informational interviews with like people from LinkedIn. And so that's been a really great way for me to just also like learn more about the field 
and like um, kind of develop my interest in genetics. And so I would say like, I would, I would encourage everyone to kind of see if there are people that they can look to for mentors, especially as an undergrad, it's never too early to start, you know, learning more about what's out there. And it can also help you decide like if you know you want to go to graduate school and like what you want to do with your career in the future. Thank you so much. And uh, for a, que a question on a few people that have said that it's really hard to get a job in academia and research. What are your thoughts on this? And also what careers do you plan on going into? Yeah, so I think about this a lot. Um, so I really want to go to academia, and I'll get into why that's not necessarily desirable uh, for everyone in a second. The most common experience for PhDs, masters, MPHs is not going to academia. There are not that many jobs in academia. Um, they uh, there's not that much funding, uh, uh, at least in the in the U.S. That goes towards uh, the average lab. The vast majority of funding goes to a couple of labs at a couple of institutions. Um, so I think it's like a really blunt truth and something that I knew very well going into my PhD. Um, it's just something that I think all of us have to grapple with. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but what's important is making sure when you're getting your graduate training and experience that you're also getting advice, preparation, and skills that can translate into industry. Um, industry can be anything from basically doing the same thing you do in academia, so like industry research, um, so as a staff scientist or as a principal investigator, it could be in science communication, um, it could be uh, through public health nonprofits and governmental institutions, international um, organi um, organizations, things along those lines. So you don't have to like not do science, just in the ac academic space, there aren't that many opportunities. Um, one reason you would stay in academia, which is one reason I'm, I really wanna stay, um, has to do with not my research because I could do it anywhere. I could do it at a hospital. I could do it at an industry um, uh, company or, or organization, but I really love teaching. Um, and that's a big part of like my identity. Um, it's a big part of how I see myself as a researcher. I think it makes me a better researcher. Um, so right now that's my goal. So some things to try to stay in um, academia are being successful with securing funding. So something I'm doing with 100% of my time right now is applying to grants through the National Institute of Health here in the US. Um, that's a big part of my training. In fact, uh, our qualifying exam as PhD students is successfully submitting a grant. Um, so that's a track record. Getting publications um, are important. Establishing independence in your program in terms of uh, being able to have your own ideas uh, independent of the people who are training you and be successful in carrying those out. Um, but what's important is uh, even if you can do all those things, there's no guarantee that you're going to stay in academia. So uh, I won't go on, but I, I think it's important to just like know that going in um, and really know that you're going to, for example, a PhD or master's or things along those lines with the expectations that you're doing it because you're interested in the work. You want to develop your training. Um, to apply somewhere else uh, or you know, even apply in academia, but just um, it's not solely about trying to get uh, a job, but that you actually enjoy the process as much as possible. Otherwise, there's plenty of excellent ways outside of graduate school to engage in science, science communication, uh, clinical care, public health, things along those lines. Awesome. So in the interest of time, I think I'll allow a short verbal Q&A session. So for whoever has a question, please raise your hand and I'll call, I'll call you out so that you can ask your question. So go ahead.
Uh, yeah, so I have a question. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of things, right? So, I'm in the Come again, I think you're quite inaudible. Okay, so let's see. Right now, I'm doing a lot of things, right? So, as I'm proceeding to ask, am I allowed to send a or community psychology? So sorry, I'll have to ask you to type your question in the chat because I don't think this you can be heard properly. Um, meanwhile, if there's anyone else who also has a question, please feel free to ask. We're about to close soon, and I don't want anyone to feel like they've been locked out of finding out something life-changing. Elif, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, firstly, I, I will uh, thank you to all speakers. It was a very nice uh, workshop today. And so I would like to ask, what are the challenges that we might face while searching for a neuroscience internship? Um, yeah, just to start it off, I think the main things that I faced, um, of course, my experience is from someone who grew up in uh, someone who's doing their degree in India. Uh, but the main thing I faced was like getting people to to say yes, you got to go through a lot of cold emails and um, internships are very short, which means you'll have to target labs where you can contribute and learn something in a short period of time. So if you're if you're targeting a lab that requires a technique where you'll only end up learning it in three months, there's no point. So you'll have to, you know, weigh your uh, choices. And um, that's definitely something you'd want to consider for an internship. Are you going to spend that time learning the technique or are you trying to collect data? Um, because it's very unlikely that professors want to take students when they have very involved work, especially something that I see in um, behavioral and animal-based work. Um, and uh, what else? Internships. I think, I think another thing that I interestingly saw was that um, uh, some people do expect prior experience in, in whatever you're doing, especially if it's uh, experimental research, but also if it's analysis, coding, things like that. So if you have an internship that can last, you know, like six or seven months, you you probably have a, a better shot at it. Um, but overall, I would recommend uh, applying within local circles and then uh, going ahead or, or at least simultaneously applying both locally and internationally, because obviously an international internship or anything that's far enough away from where you are is, is going to be a bigger bet for the PI to take on you. And it's also going to be more expensive. Okay, thank you. Before I allow Trish to ask her question, Christian has posted his question in the chat. And he says, I'm currently studying law and I wanted to ask whether I'm allowed to venture into psychology and neuroscience at a research level. Actually, yeah, I've seen someone and I've seen Patrick answer his question. So I think Trish, you can go ahead and answer and ask your question. All right, I have a couple of questions. The first one was kind of based up the question Patrick was asked was asked earlier about transferable skills outside of or in academia and potentially careers. I was wondering about any transferable corporate skill skills at all that you acquire throughout like a neuroscience doctoral or graduate degree. For example, I'm also in the US. I go to the University of Pittsburgh. There are a few companies like Merck and other pharmaceutical companies. Um, how would you qualify? How would you go about exploring different careers with your 
um, neuroscience skill set. Yeah, so a way a couple of my uh, colleagues have transitioned out. So even though neuroscience is very like biology heavy in many cases uh, or psychology heavy, um, it's definitely a field on the cutting edge of things like machine learning, AI, data analysis, um, signal processing um, for a lot of folks that aren't me, uh, something called like neurophotonics, which can be very helpful in uh, industry. So a, a lot of folks who pivot to industry and stay in research really lean on those skills. Um, because at least for example, what I do, even though I'm studying like specifically anesthesia and do a particular type of statistics, right? Like I'm able to do pretty much any thing that has to do with data varying over time in industry. So that's like anything from like insurance uh, to, you know, economic forecasting to like risk analyses and things along those lines. Um, so I, I think like that's definitely transferable. Some of my friends who are cognitive neuroscience PhDs are very successful in like behavioral economics and like marketing jobs. Um, more broadly in terms of like outside of those industries, you're managing your own PhD thesis uh, or same thing with masters, you're managing your own master's thesis if you have a master's component or a thesis component. Um, so that's project management. There's obviously a lot of stakeholders involved. So even though it's your research, for me, I have collaborators at multiple institutions and in multiple departments and experts in different areas uh, and non-technical experts who um, are really important in like compliance and stuff like that. So effective communication, product management, um, and things along those lines uh, are common. And then I guess like finally, real quick, uh, if you design anything, so if it's like a new method or software package, um, in my case, it's a software package, you're learning about creating uh, open access software and coding best practices, and how do we design with users in, uh, in mind um, to sort of improve their experience. So it's going to depend on your actual research and degree, um, uh, but I, I think like the the notion that um, you know graduate school in any area doesn't have transferable skills um, is definitely like outdated in the sense that you're asked to do so much in every one of these programs that it's impossible to not uh, do that. So the the harder part is uh, communicating to potential employers why your skill set is relevant as opposed to like, am I gonna have any skills that apply outside? Awesome, that was a great answer. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Patrick. Um, we're actually running really short of time. And so some of our panelists will have to be leaving soon. So I'd like to invite Somo to give his closing remarks before he can leave. Yeah, so. I just want to say thank you to everyone who attended today. It was really great to share this panel with uh, distinguished speakers and be able to share our experiences about graduate school and, and neuroscience in general. Uh, I put my email in the chat for those who have any specific questions about uh, epidemiology, public health, or neuroscience and the intersection of all those three. And I just wanted to leave with some remarks saying that if, if you're passionate about neuroscience and you know this is something you want to do, just keep that passion, uh, use it as motivation, and always just try and expand your network, even if that means cold emailing, uh, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, just having a quick talk with someone to get advice. Um, your knowledge is your power, and, and your passion is what will take you to what you want to be. So um, best of luck to everyone, and it was uh, a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. Um, I think I just invite the rest of the panelists to finish up. And I hope the rest of you have seen the emails. I've dropped the emails in the chat. So you feel free to ask any question that you feel would pertain to any of them. And I'm sure you'll be fine. So Patrick, you can go on. Yeah, again, I just want to um, say a special thanks to all my co-panelists. Um, it was really great to hear their experiences and um, you know, I, I really appreciate um, Simply Neuroscience for putting this together. And um, so we're able to sort of share this space together and, um, you know, lean on the experience of one another. Um, I'll echo um, what was just said in the sense that uh, just really 
sounds cheesy, but follow your passion. Uh, you know, I, I think um, it the world feels very competitive all the time, and it's far more important to be you know using your time and energy on things that you're excited about with people that you're excited about, um, rather than trying to always guess. You know, what's the right move to make, or you know, what mistakes do I avoid? Um, I think just being yourself, uh, experiencing what there is to experience, and then kind of going from there is an excellent way not only to get into neuroscience, but to engage in any field. So definitely reach out to me um, over email if you're interested in um, you know, computational neuroscience, uh, in precision medicine, or things along those lines. Also plug my talk later uh, this week uh, in precision medicine. So definitely feel free to come to that. Um, but yeah, definitely connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, email. I'm happy to be as much of a support as I possibly can, but thanks so much. Yeah, no, thank you to the Simply Neuroscience event planning team for putting this all together. Um, and also like, thank you to my fellow panelists. This was a really great discussion about graduate school. And I also just wanna thank, you know, everyone that's been asking all these questions. Like I, I love seeing all the engagement in the chat and everyone's been asking really great questions today. So love to see it. Um, yeah, and if anyone has any questions related to neuroscience, genetics or public health, feel free to reach out to me. My email is in the chat. Um, I'm also open to doing coffee chats if anyone's interested in that. So feel free to reach out to me. But yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, everyone. It was really great to be here. So I will close again by saying thank you to everyone for your engagement, for joining. I'm so, so happy to see all this engagement. And it is really, really, it's a really rewarding experience. And we hope to see a lot more of it for the rest of the week. So thank you so much. Have a good day, night, wherever you are. And we hope to see you the rest of the week. Thank you.